Okay, so on the last day of the class, June 30th, our project is coming along pretty well. Content-wise, it's still lacking. Structure-wise, it's coming along well. If you open up your um, index file in Google Chrome, remember you can test it with the mobile emulator. Press F12 and then select the toggle device toolbar. So it's a quick way to check mobile, mobile features. And so uh, we'll fill in the details about actual content later, but we're getting all of the structure set up. This is all thanks to jQuery Mobile. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do is add now, based on the concept that we had over on the About screen, I want to add the, uh, the map feature to the project. I want the project to, to now um, have map capabilities. This is going to be another example where we can reinvent the wheel or we can get a head start. Um, so we're, I'm going to provide a starting point because to create the map feature from scratch it's about a hundred lines of code and we could go through it line by line and such but what I'm going to do is give us a starting point and I'll explain what we have and we'll explain then how to use it ourselves for our purposes so what you want to do is go to the network folder open up our class folder and get a copy of a file called m.html from the network folder copy m.html to the root of your project folder. <clears throat> then we'll take a look at what that is. Copy m.html. And I'm going to put it into the... <clears throat> I'm going to put it into my project folder. There's my project. So I've got the index file, I've got the Kodika external files, all of those jQuery, jQuery mobile files, and something called M. So if you just directly open that m.html in the browser, it will um, open up a map that is not quite complete yet. It has some functionality. It's not quite complete. And so what we need to do is work with this starting file um, in Notepad. So copy that note, copy that M file, and then right-click it and edit Notepad. Plus plus. And this is a starting point. It's uh, 117 lines. What this is, is a way for us to tap into a live Google map. And most of the hundred lines of code is JavaScript. There's very little that is actually plain HTML. And also, I don't think really there's any CSS in it, except for the jQuery and all of that. So this starting point, if you notice at the very bottom, there's a, there's a comment. There are so many ways to do the same thing in every programming language. Everyone can, can differ on the right way to do something. And everyone is right and everyone is wrong. It just depends on what you're trying to accomplish, really. How elegantly, how verbose, how obvious, how obfuscated. Have you heard that there's a contest? I forget what it's called. I think it's called something like the, the most obfuscated programming language in the world contest. Something like that. It's about a contest where people try to write the most complicated code to create the most basic things. And so whereas someone might spend simply like 10 lines of code to get something accomplished, people take pride in spending 50 lines of code to do the same thing. The more complex, the better. That's one, one route, of course. The other route is to have it simple and elegant. And so what I've got here is 
a link over to stackoverflow.com. I think I might have mentioned this site briefly on day one, probably. But stackoverflow.com is one of the best places to go to look up information and get answers if your code is not quite behaving. Uh, if you've had this problem, someone else has probably had the problem. And if you search on Stack Overflow, you'll probably find a version of a solution. I myself have found several times uh, a starting point for me to then shape it to be what I want. And that's what this is here. A few years ago when I was developing this course, and I wanted to add map features. There's lots of ways to do it. Um, this was one possible way over from Stack Overflow. So you can go read the original article there and see a lot of other examples of how you can edit this. But let's break down what, what we actually have. At the very top, it's an HTML5 document. There's a head section, meta title, links and scripts. All of, that's, all of that we've seen before, although the order of the uh, scripts might not be in the best place yet. Notice all of those are also pointing to the online versions of jQuery. We could edit those to point them to the local versions. Um, leaving these alone it would be okay because this map feature anyway needs an online connection. It's going to need to tap into a real Google Map on the internet. It's not going to save all possible Google Maps to your device. You know, that would be like a 10 gigabyte file or something. So notice there's also a, a, a line here, maps.google.com slash maps API slash JavaScript. This is connecting over to the Google Maps JavaScript file, the API. An API is an application, what's it stand for? Application Programming Interface? Programming. Application Programming Interface. It's like uh, an entry to be able to access the features of something, of uh, some sort of library oftentimes. So we will see we can get pretty advanced with this. Many websites nowadays give us an API a way to tap into the features and capabilities of some service. I don't want to invent my own map service, but I can tap into Google's, I can tap into Yahoo's, I can tap into Bing's. They allow API access. They allow us to tap into their features. We can go look up the official Google Maps API documentation and you know read a couple hundred pages to see how exactly it works. We can go over to the Twitter API page and read, how do I write some JavaScript to tap into Twitter? I can go to Flickr. I can go to the Internet Movie Database. So many of these websites that are full of data provide some form of API for us to tap into. And oftentimes with these common languages, JavaScript, for example. So right here we're tapping into all the features of Google. Then we've got some inline or embedded JavaScript starting on line 10 going all the way down to line 94. We'll explain those lines in a moment. Skip down to 96. Then the actual body of the document starts 96 to 116 ish. So only about uh, 20 lines of code of actual HTML and the rest of the 100 is JavaScript. We will often see this that the JavaScript files and code are the ones that are the biggest resource in our project because JavaScript can do so much. JavaScript can manipulate and create HTML and CSS dynamically, as we'll see later. So then what starts are some divs. These are still set to divs rather than article and section and all of that we'll need to fix. But it's got div data role page, and that makes sense because we've got jQuery mobile at the top of the document. This is a jQuery mobile enabled project. It's got an ID of map, data role header, that'll need to be fixed, directions, data role content, that'll, that needs to be upgraded. So again, this is a, is a somewhat complete starting point, but there's still a lot that we need to do to get it to be exactly what we want. There's something that says... Yeah, this is a variation of, of what the Stack Overflow article says. There's another div, um, placeholder to display a map. Do you notice that if you do load up the project in the web browser, it does display 
a real live map. I can drop an actual little Google Street View if it's available and um, zoom in, zoom out. There's a box that displays that map. Get directions. The um, Do you see on line 106? There's a line here in 107. Something that says label. We talked about that probably on day two or day three when we were doing that simple random number picker thing. There were input boxes that we would put names into and take them out randomly. There were input boxes with labels. So that's, re that's familiar. Input boxes of type text with labels attached to them. With some text that says target destination. But I don't see that on screen. I don't see anything that says target destination. Why? Possibly it has something to do with this inline style that says display none. There's something hidden. So the CSS property display none. Let's change lines 106 and 107 where it says style display none. Let's change that to style display block. There's a few options we can choose with display. Display none hides an element. Display block is one way to display an element. So go to the end of line 107. At the very end, you'll see a little style there as well. Change that one also to display block. Save it and run it, Firefox, Chrome, whatever. And what should appear is some hidden elements. Target destination. An address. Now I'm running it, I just noticed I'm running it in Chrome first and then I ran it in Firefox and Firefox popped up with share location. Chrome didn't. That reminds me that when we test some of these features on Chrome, Chrome is very strict, especially with online resources. It disabled the GPS feature. I ran it in Firefox and Firefox was cool with it and it gave me a somewhat accurate map. Better than Chrome, which gave me some location in Texas. But here Chrome is giving me a location in downtown San Diego somewhere. Most likely because we are using our browsers tapping into the location of pr probably like the San Diego City College main servers. Right? That should be near San Diego City College, I think. So their main, their main servers over there. But anyway, it's a map. And I'm seeing target destination. That's our location here. If I click get directions, it gives me a map. But this is editable here. I can go in and change it something like uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue Washington, D.C. Get directions. It's giving me directions to the White House, only 2,695 miles away. So this map starting file has the capability for us to set, for the user to set an ending destination if they'd like. In our case, that doesn't make sense. I have my app for San Diego City College, or San Diego Continuing Head, and I want people to come here. Why would I let the person choose their destination? They just go to Google Maps for that. My app for this college, I want anyone anywhere in the city to get driving directions to this college, this campus. So that's why the default location, destination that is, is um, our campus. That's what line 107 is saying. Do you see that? Line 107. Input box of type text. It has a name. That name is being used for the label. It has an ID. 
target test, it has a value. And that's a real address. That's the address of our college here. Style display block, but it was set to none a moment ago. That was the logic of hiding those two elements. We don't want the user to change the target destination. We want them to come here. On line 107, change the value. Put anything else you want. Let me put in Southwestern College's address. If I put that, then the target destination has been altered. So think about it in terms of if this were your app for your company needing driving directions to your location. This is the way it's changed. Get directions, and it gives you directions to Southwestern College. 15.4 uh, miles. This will obviously be more accurate. Uh, we're not really in downtown San Diego. This would really be most accurate if it was on a real device, because our real device has an accurate GPS. Our desktop computers don't. They seem to be relying on the GPS of the main servers, which are somewhere in downtown. Different map? Is it in Texas? It's in Texas. Google Chrome. Google Chrome is uh, is not giving an accurate okay. GPS coordinates. That's OK. If you switch over to Firefox, it'll be the same. All right, so we're seeing where, where can we change the, the target destination. That's why those two things are hidden. That's why uh, those are set to display none. I'm going to change lines 106 and 107 back to display none. They don't display on screen, but they still function. Display none is not the same as commenting those out. Commenting it out would come would delete the code completely from the web browser. Display none simply means that it doesn't show up on screen, but all of its features are still accessible and, and usable. I'm setting those items back to display none. The next item, a href id data role button. OK, I'm seeing a button being created. Data inline true, data icon. OK, that makes sense. We've seen that some a few times. That's a button that says get directions. There's the button there. And then a div id results display none, and then div id directions. So a couple more divs, a couple more placeholders for some purpose. One of them is display none. If we set it to display block, it'll show it. But there's nothing to display. It's just two placeholders. So something else must be happening dynamically to populate those divs. Then the document ends body in HTML. So it's the JavaScript that's doing all the heavy lifting, which we'll look at in a moment. Before we do that, let's. Uh, Let's take a quick moment to change this code to upgrade it to what we've been learning. Uh, we want to change line what? Line 97 and its pair to what? Section. This is data roll page. We should be getting used to that that should be a section. Don't forget its pair down on line 114 slash section. 97 to 114, it's a section, it's a screen full of content. Line 98 and one and 100, data roll header, what should those be changed to? 
header. So now we've got the modern HTML5 semantic elements. Th these worked without us having to change it, but we want to use the right tag for the right task. That's what HTML5, one of the things, that's what it's about. One of the features is to use the right tag for the right task. We have a header tag for headers, so we'll use it rather than the generic div. <coughs> We've got div data role content. Remember, that's the outdated way of doing it. That one should be article. So line 101 to 113, article. And that's the one that you're going to need to remember, that it's not data role content, even though that'll work. That's the old deprecated uh, jQuery 1.3 version of the code. We want the 1.4 version, which is role equals main and class equals UI dash content. These other divs that do other things, we can leave those alone. Those are being used properly in that these divs are placeholders for elements that don't have a meaning like an article in a section. There's no tag really that, that works just at the moment for those, so divs are fine. I'm not saying that divs are bad and don't use them, but I'm saying we've got the proper tag for the proper element, especially with sections and headers and such just to check that we didn't mistype anything, save it and run it, and it should still look how it did a moment ago. So it still looks like before. One thing that I'm noticing that it, is that if I load up the, the site in mobile friendly view it may or may not look mobile friendly here in Chrome it seems to be okay it is stretching to the right size of this screen but I'm noticing it in Chrome it looks tiny so this is the point of this is to test on multiple browsers and eventually test on mul multiple devices. That's one of our big problems as a developer. Uh, web designers have experienced this a long time and app designers experience this also in that there's so many devices, so many sizes and form factors, dimensions, qualities, resources and these things that it um, behooves us to test as much as we can. And I'm seeing it's not mobile friendly in all screens, in all devices. At the top of our code, if you remember what our index file looks like, you should realize we're missing something in this map file that we have in the index file. What's that? No, it is there. It's just the, the online. It's the online version. We need the viewport. So yes, we could change this, but that's not affecting our mobile friendliness. What we need is the viewport setting. We need that meta tag. So let's. Uh, I don't have it memorized. Let's copy and paste it. Let's go to our index file. Go back to your index file and edit that. Here's what the index file has that our map is missing. Three things, actually. One, two of them we don't really need. The lines five through seven is what our index file has that our map file lacks. The viewport, the initial scale, remember all of that? That's the stuff that makes it much more mobile friendly. So I'm going to copy lines five through seven and paste them into um, let's see, we've got head, meta, title. So I'm going to place them in the same place. Head, meta, before title. So paste it on line 5.
Here's a little trick. This is optional, of course. I had all of this nicely lined up, and I just pasted these, and they're not lined up anymore. The trick is that you can select, I might have mentioned it before, you can select the lines just haphazardly. And if you tab, they all tab at the same time. Tab to the right, shift tab back. But I just selected all three of the lines approximately. And Notepad is smart enough then to grab them all as a group. And then I can tab them. That's optional, of course, but now it looks nice. Yes? Last time when we talked about it, we were saying that the Apple Mobile is specifically for Apple devices. Is an Apple device comes to this web app, it will be optimized for Apple devices. So go ahead and add those lines, and if you see it now in Chrome, it should be mobile friendly. Here's before, here's after. It grew to the size of the device. On Firefox, it seemed to be okay, but it's better to be specific with computers rather than guess at things. What was that trick that I mentioned previously for Notepad where you can see your code side by side? it's in here also. The quick way that I do it is right click the tab and then move to other view. So you can view both of them at the same time if you'd like. Okay, so regarding the, um, the JavaScript, um, we have all of our JavaScript before our body. And remember, over for our index, we wanted our JavaScript to happen at the end after the body. We want to do the same thing here. So either we will move the JavaScript down or we'll move the body up. Either or will give us the same result, but I think maybe moving the body up might be better. So I'm going to give myself an empty space above my JavaScript, all of this JavaScript block. Give myself some space. And then if you go down, you need to select everything from body to body. Or actually, wait a minute. We need to move the script above body, not the body itself. Um, all right, so we will move it down. We'll move all the script down to right before the end of body. So I'm going to actually do it the other way. A little bit of empty space before the end of body, and then I'll select all of that script cut and paste it to the bottom. So that'll be lines 10 all the way to 97. Now here's a trick also to select this huge chunk. You can start to click and drag. That's one way and then you overshoot it. That's one way to do it. Click and drag. Here's another way. If you click and let go of the mouse, put your cursor right there, then scroll down and then you hold shift and you click where you want the sh selection to end it'll fill it in all for you so again if I click and let go where I want the selection to start scroll down to find where I need it to end then I'm gonna shift hold shift and then click 
it's all selected and then remember you can drag and drop code Checking quickly, it should still work the same. Nothing should break. Now we've got all the JavaScript at the end. It's best practices right there. And then we'll take now a moment to uh, to fix this uh, these old this old code meaning uh, line 9 is pointing over to the old CSS file, 1.4.0, but we've got 1.4.5 in our folder. So we'll delete that to simply say the name of the CSS file, not the whole CDN, not the whole server, 1.4.5. Now at the bottom where we've got our scripts, then we've got jQuery and jQuery Mobile. Now I do have to say, there is a little problem here. We can fix the jQuery Mobile to 145, but if we then change the jQuery to 2.24 or whatever we have, the map doesn't work anymore. I'll explain why in a moment. So I will change my jQuery JS file. Works just fine. I have jQuery 224. And let me confirm uh, this won't work, so you don't have to do it yet. So, if we upgrade our jQuery mobile, then the map doesn't work anymore. It gives us some error messages that we can try to fix. This is getting us back to that issue that we saw previously about, well, we wanted to go to jQuery 3.x, and that was breaking our, our project. So here we have the same sort of thing where keep it as is because it's working, fix this issue that it's telling us, or use a version of jQuery newer that still works. I'm going to opt to leave it as is. I'm going to let it use jQuery 172. I'm going to leave that line alone. It is connected to the online version. And as I said earlier, yes, we can go and download the online version of 172 and put it into our project. But this whole map is predicated on there being an internet connection anyway. So later on, when we get more complex and actually be able to test for internet connections, we, we can deal with that. But for the moment, I'm going to leave this line as is to connect to the online version because my map functions being online anyway. And we will not be able to download this Google API JavaScript anyway. So that's another online resource that we have to connect to <laughs> online. So. Um, I believe doing some research, I think we can get like jQuery 1.9 added to the project. Maybe that'll be a little homework for yourself. Find out what version of jQuery we can use, how high can we use it. It works at the moment, so I'll keep it as is. Keep line 33 as is, of course. There's no file to, down to download. It's the API entry point, so we need to leave that alone. And then now we'll talk about what the rest of all of this script is. Any questions so far before we dive into these 100 lines? Okay, so all of this code here, 
some of it might be a bit familiar, most of it not. But if we break it down, some of the first things that we see, VAR, let's remind ourselves from a long time ago, a few weeks ago, what's VAR again? Variable. It's a container, some sort of container, and four are being created at once. Map, current position, direction display, direction service. None of them are defined. They're just being created, but they're undefined. They could have been set like map equals something. We're creating them at that moment, and then we're defining them with a value. But here, they're just being created, and they're undefined. The next line is some jQuery. We haven't written this ourselves yet, but we're going to write something like this over and over as we get more advanced in the next class. This shortcut right here, this is a jQuery mobile uh, bit of code that is like a shortcut for the longer um, plain Java JavaScript that would be something like document.getElementById. Remember all of that? This is not an ID, of course. But if we had something like document.getElementById when we were doing that on our first intro to, to JavaScript, all of that can be compressed to the dollar symbol uh, method. Whenever you see this sort of thing, dollar symbol parentheses, that often means jQuery. This is JavaScript, but it's the jQuery flavor in that we can write shortcuts. What it's got here is the object of the document uh, We've got a, the event page before show, when the document is live, wait for the event page before show. We can look up all of the possibilities there, but we're, we're going to see, for example, right away here, actually, on click. When something gets clicked, do something. Over here, before the page shows, before the page displays, do something. This is an event handler. We're, we're handling an event. We're waiting for something to happen and then we do something about it. Um, pound map page. What's the pound again? An ID. Notice that if you do have map page highlighted up on the code of HTML, Actually, wait, there's no map page. Oh, that's interesting. There's no map page. This would be uh, waiting before the page shows specifically an ID called map page, but there's no map page. I guess that's supposed to be simply map. There's an ID of map. Hmm, let's fix that. Let's simply call that map. So on the event before showing the map, do the following. Navigator.geolocation.get current position. This is some JavaScript that activates the GPS sensor of your device. So if I had this running on my real device, this thing has GPS, that little line of JavaScript right there will let me access the current position that the GPS sensor detects. It's the method get current position and it has two callbacks loc success, loc error. Location success, location error. These are two callback functions because what this is saying is we're gonna try to get the location. We're going to try to tap into the GPS chip of your device. And either there will be a success or there will be an error. So we need to deal with the success or the error. If you double click loc error, just to highlight that word, it should also highlight it everywhere else in the code. Remember, Notepad lets you when you select something, it'll highlight it everywhere in your code, which is very nice as a, as a quick way to see it throughout your code. So what we're figuring out is, okay, we're trying to get the GPS coordinates. What happens if there's a failure? Well, here's a function definition that, it, that handles that. 
that deals with a location error. For some reason the GPS didn't work, so deal with the error. Initialize, here's a comment, initialize map with a static predefined latitude longitude. So there's something that says initialize with some latitude and longitude coordinates. I believe that's somewhere around downtown San Diego. That's a function. If you select that, function initialize is defined right here. This is a longer function we'll look at in a moment. But if there's an error, place the map, initialize the map in downtown San Diego so that there's at least some starting point. If we have no GPS chip, then the initial coordinates are set to, you know, zero or not a number or the North Pole or something. So you're going to get really bad map directions from the North Pole. This is then saying at least set your starting point to downtown San Diego. Backing up, there could have been a loc success, a successful gathering of the location. That's defined right here. Function defining what loc success is. This is accepting a, um, a parameter position. It's the actual coordinates. The GPS chip spits back some coordinates, latitude and longitude, a position. Spitting it, spitting it back, it's passing it through. Then we're running initialize again. And this time initialize, instead of having a hard-coded value when there's an error, it's a dynamic value. If we were able to get the GPS coordinates, this has a built-in latitude and longitude, as well as a height, as well as an accuracy reading. We can go look all of that up. But what gets what comes out of the chip is like six different values, GPS values. Yes. When you call uh, block success up here. Mm -hmm. You're not passing a parameter, but you have something parameter. Um, the way I believe the way that that is set up, we're not we're not specifically obviously showing the the parameter coming through but the way the specification is set up, it is passing it through. So I know what you're saying about like, well, why don't we have it set up like this, data, and so forth. The way this is set up is that you don't put a function like this, defining it like this. It basically knows to pass it through. And then here we actually use it. So it would make perfect sense the way that you're saying here. There's our data, pass it in, because that's how we defined it. But the way this is set up, we just simply write the, the function uh, name itself rather than also the property that we're passing in, parameter that we're passing in. So we're passing it in and uh, we're getting specifically of that object, its position dot chords dot latitude. This comes from the specification. We can look up how does navigator work. It has coordinates, latitude, longitude, it has altimeter, it has direction and speed, all of these things that the GPS throws back at you. So we're seeing initialize being used twice on success and fail. So initialize is all of this. Initialize is set up with a latitude and a longitude parameter. Uh, it's then defining these objects, these variables, directions, display, which were defined up here. Create a map, a current position, direction, display, direction, service. We then do an object of new, google.maps.directions, renderer. That's coming from the Google API. Calling the Google API, we're creating this object to display directions, renderer, and directions, service. That is something that we would go need to look at need to go look at the documentation of Google to see exactly what it does and how it's defined, but we see how it's used in a moment. We're also setting the current position variable to 
a uh, latitude and longitude object from Google Maps based on the latitude and longitude that we, our current G, uh, GPS chip gives us. Finally, the, that empty map variable that we created previously is getting a new Google Maps object defined by document get element by ID map canvas. Uh, we've got that placeholder map canvas right there div ID map canvas. It's going to be a map that's 300 pixels tall. If we want it larger or smaller, we can change that value, maybe put a percentage. And then we've got some, uh, this is a JavaScript object here, uh, JSON notation. We'll talk about JSON notation deeper later. But we've got something that's zoom, we've got a key and a value pair. Again, when we talk about JSON in depth, this will make more sense. We've got a key and a value, zoom of 15 units. I think when we were playing with something else regarding a map, oh yes, the Kodika. That had a, a zoom value, and a smaller value zoomed you out further, and larger value zoomed you in, I think. It was backwards. So it gives us a, a zoom of 15. The center is the current position based on the GPS. Map type ID is google.maps.map.id.roadmap. There's other kinds of maps that can be displayed, road map and topographical and so forth. I don't have them all memorized, but we can look them up and change that to display a different kind of map by default. The user can still choose what kind of map to display themselves, but the road map is the default type of map to display. So this object here, this variable has become an object, and it's displaying, its, its parameters are zoom, center, and map type. Set the map on screen, uh, position marker, create a marker. If you notice, there's a marker on your map. That's a marker, current position. That's coming from right here, current position. It says current position. There's a title attached to it. If I want that to say something else, such as, you are here. Just change that. Give that a try if, if you'd like. Line 75, the title that displays on screen, make it say something else. Everything else we'll leave alone because the position of the marker is set to the current position via the GPS. Map map, uh, I think that just uses the map that is currently in use. I suppose we can use different maps at once. Hover your mouse over it, it says, you are here. If you click on that little marker, it gives you an info box. Info window, that's the next item here. Create a variable called info window. Create a new Google Maps object, info window. Um, there's a listener here, meaning waiting for something to happen. When there is a click on the current position marker, run the following function. Set content, so display something on screen. Current position, latitude, lat. Lat is a shorthand that was defined up here as the latitude. And longitude, lon. So when someone clicks on the little current position marker, open the current position marker box. And when you click, <coughs> it displays it. Current position, latitude, blah, 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 longitude, etc. I kind of don't like that it's all run together. It kind of looks a little too cramped. We can edit this. Maybe have current position on one line, latitude and longitude on the second line. Maybe I want to capitalize that too. Let's see how we can edit that code. Right here, current position, latitude, longitude. 
Well, at the very least, what I can do is change capital longitude, capital latitude. And I think to make this break onto a new line, I think we can do HTML. Let's see, does that one work, or do we need the escaped character? No, that'll work. So adding the HTML tag break will leave current position on one line, break that line. On the next line, it'll display latitude, longitude. How it dynamically displays is here. What we're writing is static, but then this is dynamic. This plus symbol we will see many times in JavaScript. Most of the time we use the plus symbol as something known as concatenation. And that fancy term basically is like, show this, and then this, and then this, and then this on screen. Very, very basically, that's what the pluses do. Show something, and then something, and then something on screen. The something is dynamic, depending on the GPS chip. So if I'm somewhere else in the city, that'll dynamically change. If we follow the code backwards, we saw that lat comes from passing in the initialization, passing it in, which came back from either success or fail. If it was success, we're getting it from the coordinates. So now if you click on that, it looks like this. We can do further styling to it, of course, if we know a little HTML. Maybe make some of it bold. Maybe move that latitude and longitude to their own lines. Maybe I want to write the word latitude and longitude. Latitude and longitude. I wrote and. Notice there is a space before and. Empty spaces are not really empty, they're just invisible. If I did not put a space there, it would display the lat value and then right away display the word and. So it would run together. I'm adding a space there to give myself a space between the coordinate and the word and. It is literal what's in the quotes. It's a string. In part two of the class, we're going to write so much custom CSS, uh, so, so much custom JavaScript. This will make much more sense. What else? After that, we've got calculate route, a function called calculate route. That one makes sense if we back up a little bit. <coughs> if you select calculate route and we back up, We have document on click. The event of click. If we click on the document, if we click anywhere on the screen, but specifically on something called directions button, there is a button right here in the code. ID, directions button. So specifically, when that button is clicked, invoke a function, an anonymous function, prevent default, don't worry about that, and then calculate route. So we're saying, click the button, run this function, calculate route. That's what's being defined further down here, calculate route. Creating another variable, target destination. We've got some jQuery here, dot val. <coughs> this target dest ID is that box right here, target dest, where we have on line uh, 22, where we've got the college's address. There's a value there. Value. And so that jQuery down at the bottom is saying, give me or get the value 
in that box uh, right here. We're saying there's an input box. That's shorthand. There's an input box. Get the value of it and store it in a variable to do something with it. So if, the, if we allowed the person to type in their own address, that's why this will still work. Even though it was hard-coded to a starting point, this is dynamic in that this will check. As soon as that button is clicked, check whatever values in there to place it into this temporary variable. A conditional statement starts here. We'll look at these later. This is to check for validity or to check uh, if things are correct. And basically, it's saying uh, current position and current position is not empty and target destination and not empty. It's saying if the values are not empty, you're good. If the values are empty, it won't work. It's saying that if a person didn't have an ending destination, don't run the map. Create another variable request. This is a JavaScript object, so more JSON right there. Origin, destination, travel mode. This comes from the Google API specification. What's our starting point origin? The current position. Where's our destination? The target destination programmed up here. What's our travel mode? Well, we're going to use the driving method, the driving mode from Google Maps. That could be driving, biking, bus, flying, I guess. Direction service route, request, response status. So it's going to check if it does have a proper, if it is a location that we can get to, and then display the results under directions. Display the step-by-step -step directions in the directions div. Display it in the div, or populate the div, and then show the div. We had display none, and then we wrote display block. But we don't need to show that div of directions until there's directions to show. So here with jQuery, we can dynamically show or hide these divs. So it's saying if there are directions to, if there are directions to, um, to display, show that div, or else there aren't dis, or else there aren't directions to display, or else there aren't directions to display. So hide that. And there's another else there from higher up there. Hide it. So that's what causes, when you get directions, to show all of this. It does all the calculation, taps into Google Maps, displays, dis shows, puts it into the divs, and then displays it on screen. Now what's this about? What are, what's, what's line 100 to 105? On the most basic level, what, what what are we looking at? Why is it green? Comments. This code has been commented out. Hmm. What if you on what if you uncomment it? Can you figure out what it does? Maybe you don't. Maybe you can't read the code. But what about if you run it? And can you figure out what it does? Let's see. step-by-step -step directions. Head north on front toward Hawthorne. Turn left at the first cross street onto Hawthorne. Take the B. It's giving us turn-by-turn -turn directions. It's kind of clunky, but it's saying there's a route <coughs> legs. So each street that you're going or how long you're on the freeway, they call it as a leg. Um, there's an X amount of legs that it takes to go from beginning to end. Store, store that in a variable and then uh, 
jump through the variable. This was similar. I think, didn't we use a for loop? We used a for loop, didn't we, when we created the that random name picker? We had seven names in the array, and we needed to pull them out, and you know we then had six to pull out, five, four, three, etc. So here we're doing something like that. Jump through the number of steps that we have, whatever the length of that is. And then there's an alert, a simple pop-up that appears. My route.steps, current index, instruction. And it seems to be giving it back to us with HTML formatting, which looks weird here. It's also displaying bold and bold, bold. So the alert isn't quite designed to display HTML content. That's why it's showing HTML tags. But later on, when we deal with more elegant methods, that can be displayed better on screen with the actual HTML styling. But that's what this bit of code is doing here, step-by-step -step directions. It was commented out. I'm going to forget what it does, so I'm going to put a comment again here. Uh, I don't think I've mentioned the single line. Did I mention the single line comment in this class? So we can do this. We can do a single line comment in a multi-line comment and say uh, creates step-by-step -step on screen directions. The point of doing the double comment like that is that if I didn't have this comment and then I removed this comment, now you've got invalid code. But if I have an inline comment and then remove the multi-line comment, that's still a comment. And then our code ends. So again, we, we could have written this step by step um, ourselves, but we have this starting file which then we can understand what it does and use it to our own advantage. And that's what developers do a lot in that I need to accomplish something, so I need to look up the reference how to do it, and then I need to apply it to my version of the code rather than having to know, having to have memorized every possibility of code and being able to regurgitate it on the spot. There is a value to that, of course, but knowing all of the HTML and all of the CSS and all of the JavaScript is not going to be that valuable. You don't need to know it all to get it to do what you need to do now. And you can look up what you don't know, learn it as you need it, perhaps, and then apply it. We're going to integrate this with our project, then we'll take a break. This is kind of breaking down in general what it is. Now we need to integrate it with our project. Before we do so, general questions on any of this? Short answer is it works. Long answer is what we just spent time talking about. Are there any general questions? So what we need to do on our index file. From the about screen, we need to add a button that says get directions, get a map, whatever we want to call it. And then we need to link that to the other file. We're going to keep it in its own separate file, as is, sort of a proof of concept. We could integrate that code into our existent files. But I want to keep it in separate files, again, to remind us of what we need to do when they're in separate files. And sometimes we need to do that. So let's get back to our code and uh, what line do we need to go to to add this button here? Who can find that line? I think I heard someone say line 278. You are correct. On line 278 is where our article main content of the about screen is. We need a new, uh, we need a button there. So uh, we kind of know that we're going to need an A tag for that. We'll call, call this map or get map, get directions, whatever we want. href, we'll, we'll set the href in a moment. We need a data roll of button so that it looks like a button. 
I'd like an icon, data-icon, and we have uh, a map icon in jQuery 145. I think it's called navigation. It might be called nav. Confirm that. Yes, navigation. There it is right here. Um, data icon navigation. So that gives us a little sort of like compass icon for navigation. What is our href going to be? m.html. We've got that whole map on a completely separate file. So we reference a different file. We did something similar when we linked over to the college's catalog. Remember, there's a button to go over to the college's catalog, an external resource. This is an external resource. We had to do something special for the college's catalog. We have to do something special here, too. One more attribute, rel, external. We're breaking out of this SPA single page app into a different file therefore the rel the relationship is that this is an external file So if you save and run that, make sure if you change anything in the map file, save that as well. So go to About, have a new button, Map, click on Map, it opens the map. I'm testing it in both browsers. see map, I click, it opens up. Again, the map is not accurate in Google Chrome. If you notice on the top right corner, there is a little icon there. This page has been blocked from tracking your location. Google Chrome often does not let a real map work when you're offline. If this project were uploaded to a real server, um, it would be able to access the location, but because since we're running it locally, it doesn't qu quite want to work. And then over here it's giving us some other errors because we don't have GPS, the API isn't quite working, and the sensor and so forth. That's why it's giving us a weird location over in Texas. But if you do get directions, it does give us a map. Back to San Diego, 1,100 miles. It's just Google Chrome trying to be more secure. In theory, I suppose what could happen is that you got an email attachment and you downloaded it without paying attention or scanning it for viruses, and you launched that email attachment and it connected to an online resource, and then you get infected. So Google is trying to help us to not load online content, because that can be an attack vector for viruses. Firefox is like, no problem, here it is, which is good and bad also. One more thing, then we'll take a break. We're, we're, at a, we're at a dead end here. This loads up, and I see no navigation elements to go back. So we've dealt with that before when we have a dead end. Let me confirm something here. I don't believe this will work. Uh, data add back btn true. Let me confirm that. Yeah. In this case, 
if we tried to add the code we've used before, data add back etn true. That worked before. It let us come from one page to go to another and go back. It's not working here because we've broken out of the whole flow of being in one file. We, um, what's that? Say that again. Um, no, no. We'll do it a slightly different way with some JavaScript. We have the ability to use JavaScript to uh, to take us back and forth in in history states. So we're not going to be able to use the data add back button. That only works when you're in the confines of your single page app. This is another con of why you might not want to use multiple files. You'll have to address navigating between them in a slightly different way. Sometimes you will need to use separate files, so that's why we're doing it like this. We need to find, uh, use some JavaScript to take us back in history. So there are two ways to do this. We can go to directly my example code, which has the answer, or we can, uh, we can look it up. So if I were to do a search, JavaScript back in history, or any variation of that sort of search term. JavaScript back in history. And you're going to see plenty of examples. There's the go method, there's the back method. Everyone's got a version. JavaScript history go negative one. There's many ways to do this. And there's a way that I've got, but just let me. I'm curious. I'm going to take that way and just plop it in and see if it, <coughs> see if it works. I'll show it to you if it does work. It seems to have worked, although the button looks weird. Yeah, most likely. Okay, so let's give this code a try here because it uh, was one of the first things that popped up. There's many ways to do it. Um, some text that says go back. Oh, I forgot to close that. Some, uh, some text. It's a link. Notice this trick here, it's not the best really way to do this, but href, instead of putting a web address, we can slip in some JavaScript. It's not really the best way to do it. Then we've got history.go, so the history object. There's a document object, a window object, a history object. There's history that we can tap into, history that JavaScript can tap into. We're saying go negative one. That seems to make sense. Go back one point in history of my web browsing. If I came from the index and I went to the m.html, there's one point in history at least. So go negative one takes me back where I came from, which was index.html. So we're, in, we're invoking some quick and dirty JavaScript here. We should really do it with a more elegant jQuery. Again, what's the best solution? What's the right solution? Everyone's got an opinion. This works. I wouldn't quite recommend it. We'll find a better version later. We'll write a better version later. Add a data roll of button. And so we get go back. Doesn't have the icon. I can add the icon. Data role, data icon, 
There's one called arrow-l. That's an L for left, not a 1. What's that? It's simply called back? Oh, cool. I believe that'll put it on the right side of the text, so we should then do data icon pass icon position left. What? It does show it on the left. Okay, good. I guess it's smart enough to, to know what I want. Okay, a little back button right there. We have arrow L, we have caret L, we have back. So there we go. We integrated the uh, we integrated the map feature into our project. It works best on a mobile device. Um, And uh, we're seeing the importance of testing on different devices. Uh, Chrome is not allowing the, the map to really work. But overall, it's working. And we're, we have this brand new feature, GPS live coordinates for your for your app. This is what we want for this particular app. If you're making your own app, this might not be quite relevant. But again, depending uh, our goal of what we're trying to do here for our project, this is this is this is pretty good. And there's many ways to do it. We could implement a Yahoo map instead. We can implement a, mo a modern version of the that reminds me, a modern version of the Google map. Right now we're using sort of like a, a quick quick and dirty version also. Uh, specifically, if you notice, uh, we've got uh, line 34, Google map v3, version 3. I don't know what the current version is, probably 4 or 5 or something. And that's why also we're leaving our jQuery at 172. The version of Google Map that we're using relies on that version of jQuery. So if you wanted to use the current version that we have of 2.24, we need to look up what version of the Google, Quer uh, Google Map JavaScript API works and then upgrade that. And most likely, because when it jumps from 3 to 4 and all of that, it's a big change, and then we need to understand what are the big differences. All right, so that works. We'll take our break. I'm going to put a copy of my code up to this point in the network folder. When we come back, then we'll start to talk about the customization via JavaScript and, and other things. So let's take a break at 7.26. We'll be back at 7.36.